Yeah, hello and welcome back everybody to my channel. This is again the small lecture on um, or foreign, no, as an introduction for business students, something about taxation and its impact or so on business decisions. Um, today's idea is um, we are going to talk about the aims or however you call it for designing taxes or how taxes can influence business decisions. So, well, economists will like to tell you that taxation may lead to a decrease in the total wealth of a population. Um, so, for example, somebody, if uh, an economist talks about public finance and its impact on macroeconomic wealth, they might show you by graphics or other proofs that um, individuals, if there were no taxes, would probably make different choices, which bring them a higher total amount of utility. Um, yes, might be. Uh, first, that's probably a trivial conclusion because it is clear that if taxation takes a bit of money away from you, with the remaining amount, you will make some different choices because um, you do not have so much money as before as you planned. If you have a million, you probably will take different consume decisions than if you have only left 600,000. Um, furthermore, naturally, one can ask a question if these economic models also um, include the fact that taxation, taxation also might increase the wealth um, which you enjoy because the state activities, if they are invested properly into infrastructure, streets, hospitals, and other things, um, might also bring along an increase in wealth. And one might also ask oneself if then um, these models also include the fact that perhaps if you stand alone, you would naturally not include um, things like financing streets and other things from which you profit if taxes exist. You would probably not include these um, spending options into your budget planning individually because you do not uh, have the possibility to do things like that alone. So it might be that when you ask an individual or if you, in a model, think about how would an individual alone spend money, um, that naturally, if there is also taxation, the individuals altogether would deliberately make different choices, which perhaps they do if they live in a democracy and the voting process um, is a kind of communicating wishes or giving feedback to politicians who spend money on taxes. Well, now, however, that's probably not the interesting stuff for you and me because macro and micro economics is rather abstract. So the welfare effects of taxation are perhaps one side of the matter, but for us, we should also think about, or we should more think about the impact of taxation, not on overall welfare of the economy, but for um, the decisions of an enterprise. So the impact on business decisions. So what should be the main aim for designing a tax law under that aspect? And very often the idea should be, it should be designed in a neutral way so that the business decisions, which would be the best um, without in a, life, in a world without taxes should probably stay the best after the introduction of the tax. So best decision without tax should remain best decision after tax too. And especially important should be the neutrality for competition. That if a customer is um, confronted with two suppliers, then the best competitor in a world without taxes should remain the best competitor in a world with taxes too so that taxes do not lead to the effect that 
let's say, a bad supplier with a bad cost management in the end wins due to the tax effects over somebody who works in a more effective and cheaper way. That would be destructive to the economy. That is easily understood. And so that is where tax law designers probably aim at. We want neutrality, especially neutrality for competition, that the best decision stays the best after a tax is introduced. That can probably not be totally achieved, but however, at least how we try to achieve that might be interesting. Well, now, in order to decide what neutrality requires, uh, one needs to know which kind of taxes exist. And um, so that is a good reason before we go into details to have a small overlook over the potential categories of taxes. There are, I must say, several ways to systematize taxes. So um, we only look at one or two of the most important ones for our aims here. So one categorization says um, we systematize classify taxes according to what is tax. So according to the object of taxation. Here we say there are taxes which have to be paid when you earn money. That is, for example, the taxes on income or on revenue. Examples would be the income tax, the corporation tax in Germany also, a tax levied by the cities on business profits, the so-called trade tax. Um, then you have taxes which you have to pay while you still have the money, so taxes on property or wealth. Examples would be an annual wealth tax, an inheritance tax, sometimes special kinds of properties are taxed, for example a real estate tax, so that's a very very old tax in many many countries of the world you have a tradition that the owners of houses or pieces of lands are taxed with a tax by the city usually. That exists also in Germany. Um, one of the reasons is even in a primitive society, you can always be sure that the owner of a house has no possibility to hide that property. So when in a medieval city you look for somebody who is wealthy, you know, wealthy people will live in their own house or will own the houses of others and it will not be possible to hide the houses and you can also not hide a piece of land. And there is another advantage combined with that. If you don't like the city's taxes, you can't escape taxation because you can flee from the city and move somewhere else, but you can't take your house with yourself. So. If you decide to tax houses, that was a very, very good first approach in the Middle Ages to say, we look for a tax base which signalizes somebody is rich, yes, and he can't escape taxation. Um, however, there might also be taxes on other kinds of property. For example, there are many uh, states where you have to pay a regular tax if you own a car depending on certain aspects of the car, not only the monetary value, but some other aspects. So when you have property, you are taxed. Then a third category is when you begin to spend the money, that is simple consume or consumption. So you have taxes on consume. Um, and there are many, many taxes. Historically, very often special expenses were taxed. Um, who could afford to buy tobacco was evidently rich in times when tobacco was a product which came from the other world, part of the world. Sugar, champagne, all that indicated you had much money and so you could also give away a bit of your excessive money to the poor, that means to the state. Later on, people began to think about that, but from the perspective of the fiscal ministry, probably everything in the world is luxury. Every money which you spend was taxed under pretext. And so somebody said in the end, someone 100 years ago, well, let's be honest, 
every single um, unit of money which we spend is probably taxed as luxury, luxury expense. So let's at least simplify life and don't take 1,000 different taxes on 1,000 different products and services. Just let's be honest and say everything somebody spends on consume is worth taxing. And that was the idea in the moment when value added tax, a tax on all the turnover or all the consume expenses of the citizens was invented. So you see here that this system is pretty comprehensive. Uh, logically, there seems to be no additional possibility. However, there are even some taxes which not fit in here, but you see that taxation has nearly filled up every moment which you can imagine in the history of your money. When you get it, when you have it, when you spend it, always you will be taxed with some special taxes. Well, another um, yeah, or a background behind beyond this um, system of taxes should be um, cleared up. Very often, for example, you get comments that few of these taxes are not justified, not fair, and so. However, the idea beyond these taxes is, if you look to these three things, that everything you see here is an indicator for being rich, wealthy, that that signalizes an ability to pay. So if you have a high income, this is evidently a reason why one could expect that you share. If you don't have a high income, but you sit on an enormous property, an enormous fortune, trillions of trillions, then nobody would accept that you do not pay taxes if you don't have a positive income this year. You would still be regarded as the wealthiest person in the city. Nobody would accept that a cleaning woman or a cleaning person or um, a very poor police officer have to pay taxes and you sitting on your trillions don't pay because this year you did not invest your money. You just enjoy your enormous piece of lands, forests, parks, and so where you obtain no profit from. That would be unfair. Um, so property, enormous wealth indicates an ability to pay and also wasting money on unnecessary luxuries is also something which indicates that you evidently have too much money. And so if others save up every euro, they would probably not be very happy if they see that you don't pay taxes when you waste money like the richest guy in the world. So. All these three objects here are indicators for an ability to pay, and they are the justification why people demand taxes from you. Um, so income tax, who obtains a high income, gets richer at that moment and can also share with the public. Wealth taxes, who is rich, can also give a bit away for the others. So pay taxes because you just are rich at the moment and consume taxes if you can afford to waste money for unnecessary luxury then you can also be expected to give away a bit for the others. The, that is the underlying logic and you see that for each category of taxes another indicator, another justification is a logical background. Now, what you should avoid, but what sometimes happens in the press also is that people measure the adequacy of a certain tax by measuring its effects against the impact on another ability to pay indicator, um, which is not the best idea, I think, because especially with value-added tax, it's often called a regressive tax because people with a low income usually spend a higher amount of their income on consume expenses than rich people do. If you have a million, you probably save much of your money and don't always waste a million a day. 
So your consumed taxes are probably, let's say, 19% of, okay, what can you spend if you're really busy in spending, let's say, 1,000 or 2,000 a day? More, I regard, as nearly impossible. So there, your consumed taxes end up. This is, if you get 10 or 100 million income per year, probably a very small percentage of your income. Whereas somebody who is poor probably can't save money and spends everything. So nearly 100% of the income will be subjected to consumed taxes. So in relation to the income, the let's say 19% value added tax um, is far higher, higher percentage than the percentage which the rich spends on consumed taxes. Well, there is, however, a logical mistake underlying these comparisons. This logical uh, problem is simple, uh, it can be simply explained. When you say that consume is a measure to decide if taxes are justified or not, if you have that underlying assumption, then you can't afterwards say, now we compare the question if consume taxes are justified by measuring the effect of consume against another completely different and unrelated indicator for ability to pay. Naturally, when you decide consume is a justification for a tax, then it's a bad idea to say what does it in relation to income because for that you have an income tax. Uh, so if you measure the effects of a consume tax against income that is negating, denying, um, the justification of a consume tax in itself. If you say consume is a justification, so for taxing people, then your underlying assumption is who wastes money, who lives a generous life, um, should pay. And we then under that aspect, don't look to the income situation. So um, if you accept the existence of a consume tax as such as justified, then the effect of a consume tax should be measured against the consume aspect or under the consume aspect only. Um, that is perhaps a bit abstract. So let us have an eye on Scrooge McDuck in German called Dagobetter. Scrooge McDuck is, as you all know, I hope at least, that you are familiar with classic literature. Scrooge McDuck is a fantastic yardere. So um, that was a, a word explicitly kind coined for him. He has trillions of trillions, swims in money, literally. And, um, well, his consume habits are a bit different. Because if you are familiar with Scrooge McDuck, the guy is able to drink tea throughout the whole week, but the tea bag is used on Monday, reused on Tuesday, reused on Wednesday, Thursday until Sunday, and probably when the new week begins, a new bag of tea is then bought and used. So under that aspect, he behaves like the poorest guy in town. So Coach McDuck wears a suit which was bought several decades ago in the Klondike area when he was uh, looking for gold there. And since then, this um, one and only suit of the guy has always been mended, repaired, and kept in. So uh, the expenses or the expenditure for fashion is the lowest in town. Scrooge McDuck also is a guy who strolls through the parks in the town in the morning until he has found a newspaper of the same day, which has been abandoned by the previous owner so that he can read the newspaper for free. So under the consume aspect, Scrooge McDuck's life resembles closely to that of a homeless person. Minimum consume under the consume aspect. Coach McDuck is the poorest guy in town. When you find somebody coming from outer space, going to Earth, he would, and he, the newcomer, does not know about bank accounts and all these illusionary things which we have built up in our economy. 
claims against other people written down somewhere, property which on paper belongs to you. If a newcomer from outer space just sees how Scrooge McDuff lives, he says, the guy is the poorest guy in town, or he would not see any difference between a homeless person and Scrooge McDuck. So if you see to what life he really leads, then you should come to the conclusion under the consume aspect, Scrooge McDuck is a very poor old guy, and we would pity him under that aspect. Indeed, everybody among us would say, how can a guy with so much money be so mad to live this way. So under the consume aspect, taxation is indeed not justified. Now, if you see that the guy is the richest guy in town and has trillions of trillions, you would say this result must be wrong. No, it is not. But as we see that the consume aspect does not reflect the whole aspects of reality, we also have a pillar which is called income taxation and property taxation. And indeed, because consumer taxation of Scrooge McDuck reflects only a part of real life, consume Scrooge McDuck, the most pitiful guy in town, I would not like to change with an income aspect, I would really prefer to be Scrooge McDuck. So, under the income tax aspect, well, Scrooge McDuck is heavily taxed. He is the richest guy in town. He pays the highest grade percentage of taxes. And in the combination, you have a kind of a adequate reflection of what is going on in life. And so, to measure the effect of a consume tax, against income, that's just mixing up two different things, yeah. two different basic um, perspectives, and only having all these perspectives separately, the three ones, gives you a kind of a good combination which reflects the actual ability to pay. Look at the consume aspect again. If somebody buys a flat screen TV, a luxurious one for 5,000 euro, or if somebody buys a flat screen TV or even only a TV set, and if that person is a poor person, that is still an unnecessary luxury, especially when you look to the bad quality of computer, uh, of TV programs in recent times. It's, even, it's genuinely a waste of money so it is a luxury expense. And even if a poor person wastes 200, 400 or 500 euro on such a TV, TV screen, this is luxury for a poor person, but luxury, unnecessary. Um, so you could justify to say, okay, if somebody, although being poor can afford or decides to afford such luxurious things, then that person could also afford to give a bit for the, for the others, so for the state. However, in contrast to that, a meal consisting of bread and water is not luxury, even if it is bought by a rich person. So if you think about treating consume as an indicator for wealth or for ability to pay, and the aspect who can waste money in an unnecessary way, is also able to pay. Then you would say whenever some person buys bread and water, that's evidently, that's not a luxury expense. It should be untaxed or doly taxed. When somebody affords TV screen or something like that, that's unnecessary for living. That's already wealth, not something extraordinary. You can tax that. If somebody goes to the doctor to cure a disease, that's uh, that's not luxury, that's necessary to survive, you should not tax it. On the other hand, if somebody goes on holiday, even if a poor person goes on holiday, that is perhaps the one and only element of a bit of luxury in that poor person's life. By the way, don't misunderstand me, that poor person has a moral right to a bit of luxury more than you and me perhaps, but 
Nevertheless, if you decide that luxury expenses justify that you ask a bit hmm, for the others, a bit of a tax, then you must be consequent and say, okay, then on that luxury expense, that expense which is not necessary to survive, one can, this justification and fairness, claim a tax. Hmm. So I hope you got this. Hmm. Very often people mix up the effects when they discuss um, the justification of taxes in the press. So, so every tax should be judged against its own indicator of wealth and ability to pay. Otherwise, you get nonsense. Complete nonsense, by the way, can very often be found in the press when journalists sometimes talk about the tax payments of a multinational group or so and state that these group members only pay 0 0.000 many zeros are 1% taxes. And then you find out when you closely read the article that this figure, this percentage has been computed as taxes divided by revenues from sale. Whereas the comparison is made with the regular income tax rate, and the income tax rate goes up to 45% from 15% or so, at least in Germany at the moment. But the 45% are defined completely different because this is a percentage of your income. And um, now income uh, can, and sometimes at least is, can be a very small percentage of the revenue. So here you compare apples and peas or so, um, you compare things which can't be compared. Mm -hmm. uh, imagine you are somebody working in the stock exchange, then you will sell and buy for enormous millions and perhaps you have in the end only made a profit of 10,000, which is nice for a day, but um, in relation to your revenues, to your sales and expenses or so, it will be a very slow amount, very small amount, sorry. Um, so they're completely uncomparable things are compared. And so whenever you have a discussion in the press or somewhere else about the justification of a tax, be aware of what people do there and if there are logical sins underlying uh, that discussion. Okay, so let's first memorize. We have three categories of taxes, taxes on income, taxes on wealth, taxes on consume. They all have their justification and they should be assessed within their own framework. And you should not fall victim to debates which mix up uh, the different viewpoints. Well, a second important distinction uh, deals with the way how the taxes are collected. There are direct taxes and there are indirect taxes. And the direct taxes are taxes where that person whom the legislator wants to bear the financial burden is also the person who is addressed by the fiscal office and asked to pay the tax. So the legal obligation to pay the tax um, hits the person which is also meant to pay in the end. So that person is the taxpayer and you also want to plunder that taxpayer's pocket effectively. That is, uh, for example, income tax, corporation tax, trade tax, also taxes on wealth are mostly or exclusively, perhaps even direct taxes. On the other hand, when you have taxes on consume, there it is very difficult to ask a consumer, how much did you consume last month? Make a list. Uh, what did you spend on bread and butter and water? And what did you spend on unnecessary things? Make, make a list and then, um, then pay. Um, it's absolutely impossible uh, to do it this way because the private consumer will have no bookkeeping. Um, you can't track person's private consumes. People will lie if it brings advantage to um, under the tax aspect. So completely senseless. But um, now fortunately somebody found out decades or even hundreds of years ago that what 
the expenses are for the consumer are necessarily the revenues for the other side, the revenues for the business owners. And so when people want to um, tax consume expenses, the easiest way is just to ask the business owners for the amount of the revenues. What do you take in as revenues from sales? And then we levy a tax on that. The idea is then that if the business owner knows when I get 100 euro revenue from sales, I will be charged with a tax of, let's say, 20% on that. Then for the business owner, that is a kind of a cost. So the, the calculation will be changed. They say, if I want to retain 100 euro, I have to gross up the price to 120. And so in the end, it is the business owner who is taxed, but according to the plans of the people who designed the law. It is already a built-in effect that they expect the business owner is going to increase the tax, the price by the tax. And so you, the consumer, will pay the consume tax by the higher price now. That is an indirect tax, yes. And the effect is, or the decisive thing is, According to the plans of the person who designed the law, the person who is officially liable to pay the tax, the official taxpayer, is expected to pass on the financial burden from that tax via higher price demands to the final customer. If that completely works in real life, does not play a role. The decisive thing is, it's the plan of the legislator, it should work this way, and in an ideal world, it would really work this way. Nearly all consumed taxes uh, are levied this way. For example, VAT, so value-added tax, coffee tax, tobacco tax, um, not perhaps car tax, um, where one could dispute if it's rather a property tax or a consumed tax. We, oh, we don't quarrel about that now. Well, now, if we have now obtained an overview about which taxes exist and we think about neutrality principles, how do you need to design these taxes in a way that they work without ruining the economy and the businesses? Then let's begin with neutrality principles for indirect taxes because they are most easily to deduct. Um, first, one demand or one um, need which you have is neutrality for competition in an internal situation. A good must always be taxed in the same way, irrespective of who is selling it. So when you levy a tax on coffee, Either all sellers of one kilogram coffee have to pay the same amount, let's say two euro 19 per kilogram, or all sellers have to pay the same percentage of the price, 19% on the wet net value, that is 19 out of 119% of the gross value, or a combination of both approaches. So for example, in Germany, tobacco taxes or fuel taxes would work that way, that every unit causes a fixed minimum amount of tax and then additionally a certain percentage of the price is also demanded. These ways have high importance because if things would work otherwise then you find out why this principle is nice and necessary. As always, ladies and gentlemen, when you want to find out why a rule is designed or makes sense in the way in which it is designed, just imagine the rule would not exist and the world would be different. What would happen? So let now imagine a world where two suppliers of the same good are taxed differently. What would happen? Then we easily see why the principle of taxing a good in the same way is important. So here we have a customer and now seller A, seller B. Seller A has cost for the product of one euro. Seller B has cost of the product of one euro. So they are equally good in producing that good. 
Um, now A is charged with a tax of 2 euro per unit and B is charged with a tax of 5 euro per unit. This tax has for them the character of additional costs. So their price calculation is seller A must ask a price of 3 euro per unit price, which seller B needs to ask is 6 euro. Now we can easily conclude where will our consumer buy? That's evidently seller A. Seller B has no chance, his enterprise will fail and vanish from the market. So after a while, only sellers taxed at two euro per unit will be left over. And that immediately makes clear why neutrality of, comp of competition with regard to the goods, same tax for every supplier is a triviality. If you deviate from that principle, then in the medium or long run, only the sellers with the best tax situation will remain. All the others will go bankrupt. So if you try to deviate and say we have different tax rates for a good kilogram coffee, one pays two euro, the other category of sellers paid five euro per kilogram coffee, then in the end you end up with only having this one category left over. So you just kill off the market half of your enterprise owners, which should probably not be the effect of a good tax system. So if it does not treat competitors equally, an indirect tax would strongly distort the market, eliminate those businesses which are treated in a less favorable way. And this cannot be your a good motive for designing a tax law. So that is the first neutrality principle which you have to stick to if you design an indirect tax. The second one is you need also to ensure neutrality in a cross-border situation. So for this, there is in general the principle that taxation with an indirect tax should only happen in the country of destination, so in the market where the good goes to and not in the country where it comes from. So that means all imports should be taxed in under the laws of that country where the consumer is and where consume takes place. So everything which comes into that country of the consumer from outside, so all imports must be taxed in the consumer's country. However, if you sell something to a foreign country, then you are not the country of destination. If you export something, so it should be left free of tax in the country of origin, because everybody knows in the country where it goes to, it will be taxed. And additionally, you will have to establish mechanisms how to uh, control the flow of goods across the borders, because you have to detect the imports and tax them. And if some people say we don't pay taxes on the goods which we sell because we exported them, you also must be able to verify that these goods really left the country and went somewhere else. So that necessarily follows from that principle of taxation in the country of destination. Again, the question regarding the why. Why is it so um, mandatory, compulsory, convincing, or however you call it, that taxation can only happen in the country of destination of the good. Well, if you want to understand it, let's again imagine what would happen if that principle did not exist. Well, so what would happen if not all imports were taxed under the rules of the country of destination? Let's See, here's the customer again. The customer is in Germany. And in Germany, in the inland, everything costs a value-added tax of 19%. So if we have supplier A from Germany, and supplier A can produce for 100 euro, including a small profit margin, then supplier A says, if I want to retain 100 euro from the sales price, I must add 19 euro on top. So the minimum price which I need to ask my customer for is 190. Now supplier B is from Switzerland. Supplier B has cost of 100 
is equally good in production, equally effective, everything's fine. But in Switzerland, the VAT rate is only approximately 8%. I believe at the moment it's even only 7.7, but 8 is nicer. Um, so the Swiss could offer for 108. And um, supplier C from an unknown state X has cost of 100, has 10% um, only could offer for 110. Now, imagine you are the German customer and you have the choice between the offers made by the three suppliers. Where would you buy? Um, now, the answer is evident. You would buy from the Swiss supplier. That's no possibility of even discussing it. So 108, the Swiss would win. What would that mean for the German suppliers? Well, no German supplier could ever stand the competition of a foreign supplier from Switzerland. So whole sectors of economy, nearly all the economy, would break down against the Swiss competition. So how can you avoid that? Um, what is the only measure you can take to be sure that a foreign supplier can never have a price advantage? Well, the answer is simple. Here you have our customer in the inland you have the Swiss competitor and you have a border. So when that good, which is offered by the Swiss supplier, crosses the border, you look to it, you say it has a value of 100 net. So we add 90% um, as value added tax on the border. And so the same happens to supplier C's product. And then the price can never become lower than 119. And the price can never become lower than 119 if something is offered by supplier C. And this importation tax is a very effective shield of German producers against foreign competitors who perhaps have to pay a lower tax. So it's a necessary requirement for indirect taxes that at the border, when a good crosses the border, the local tax will be charged, all local taxes. So value added tax, coffee tax, whatever applies for the product in question, everything. So that there can be no price advantage from foreign suppliers. That leads to our first conclusion. Imports must always be taxed at the border. Now, the second aspect of the principle of taxation in the country of destination is exports must be left tax-free. Um, why does this automatically follow from the principle that imports will always be taxed? Again, to understand this, imagine what would happen if a state would do it differently. We have again our customer in England, in Germany, we have the Swiss supplier. The Swiss supplier has costs of 100. The good goes to Germany. So everybody knows 19 will be charged on top. The minimum price is 119. What would happen if the Swiss state then demands their own value added tax also on top? Then we would have 119 plus additional eight as cost. So the Swiss minimum price would be 127. That would be far higher the price of any inland competitor who could, as we know, offer for 119. So that would bring along no chance at all for the Swiss seller to successfully sell to Germany if he's equally good than a German competitor. No chance. Banned and killed from the market by the value added tax of its own home country. So the necessary consequence, if you as a Swiss legislator do not want to um, forbid your people effectively any exportation of goods, then the necessary consequence you have to draw is renounce on that additional aid because you as a Swiss state cannot prevent the German 19 coming on top. They will be there. And so, necessary consequence, if a state does not want to forbid effectively or prevent effectively all export activity of its own enterprises, then you necessarily need to follow the second part of the destination country principle. That means all exports must be left tax-free. 
So to sum it up, the principle of taxation in the country of destination implies that a seller's product which goes to South Africa must never be taxed in Germany, but must be taxed in South Africa. Someone must take care of paying the tax there and someone must take care of giving necessary proofs that the product has left Germany so that the export is left tax free. And so for both purposes, you need customs controls so that the system can work. Uh, official that the German border must certify that the good was really exported so that uh, Germany can safely renounce on taxes and somebody at the border of the destination country um, will have to levy the tax there. That is usually indeed done by customs officials at the border. Um, a peculiarity is given between the EU states. Their border controls have been abolished and customs officer can no longer certify the flow of goods. Um, and they can no longer take care of levying the importation taxes at the border. There within the EU, the entrepreneurs have been given the task to sometimes declare and pay the taxes of the foreign country themselves. So if you send something to France, it can happen that as a German enterprise owner, you are subjected to French law and have to pay French taxes to the French authorities for the goods which you send there because your good has France as destination country. That, however, has brought along the need that the German enterprise owners may have a fair chance to understand and know the indirect tax rules of foreign countries. And that led to the necessity to make sure that the foreign rules are similar enough to your home state rules that you can easily learn how the rules work or at least understand when you need advice or you can expect that a foreign tax must be paid. And that led to a harmonization, at least a partial harmonization of the rules on the most relevant indirect taxes in the EU, especially value added tax. Rules have been nearly completed, uh, completely harmonized by EU legislation. So um, the power to legislate about value added tax lies only formally with the um, German Bundestag or other parliament of member states. Actually, the member states have to follow the orders of the EU in the legislation on value added tax mostly. So, by the way, this is a good occasion to repeat some basics about um, EU law as far as it might become relevant for taxation and other legal stuff. Um, you know there are EU directives, there are EU regulations, and are, there are some binding rules in the EU treaties themselves, and you should be able to distinguish them. So let's begin with the thing in the middle, EU regulation. This is nothing else than a law issued by the EU. So an EU regulation can directly create obligations and rights for you and me, the citizens of a member state. In contrast to that, an EU directive is um, something different. It's not a law in itself. So an EU directive cannot create obligations for citizens of a member state. But the EU directive will give binding orders to the parliaments of the member states that they have to create a law which complies with the orders of the directive or that they have to change their existing laws in a way that all details of these law comply with the orders of the directive in every point where the directive gives an order. The member states are only free to regulate the rest of the contents of that respective law according to their discretion where there is no binding order of the EU yet. And last but not least, it may be that you also have some rules in the treaties themselves which have immediate effect and have a kind of um, an effect which is like a constitution 
um, rule. For example, that state aid is forbidden, that is directly a legal rule. It's effective and applicable in all member states. And there is also precisely laid out when deviations are possible and when they are not. Or there is also um, a rule that capital um, can be freely invested or requested cross border throughout the EU and very often also with um, in the relation with such countries. So when you look to evaluated tax, you see again, sorry, that is too far back. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, here, sorry. You see that the value added tax rules are mostly harmonized by EU legislation. Also, on other indirect taxes, we have um, common rules laid down in EU directives. So, uh, there we have close harmonization. That means similar structures or even similar contents in different laws of the member states because the EU issued binding directives on the matter. Okay, so let's sum up what we can um, conclude or what we can summarize when it comes to the principle of taxation in the country of destination. Well, first, in the area of indirect taxes, you never need something like double taxation treaties because there is no quarrel about who it has the right to tax a good. Everybody agrees that the indirect taxes on a certain good shall only be levied in the country where that good goes to the market, where the consumer is or the consume happens, however you describe country of destination. So there is always only one state which can claim and will claim the tax. So there is no need for any detailed international treaty agreements on the matter. Only in the few cases where one might dispute where consume takes place might usually be with some strange services or so. There one might talk about hmm, additional clarifications, but then usually countries will take care on their own that their own market is protected and that their suppliers have a chance in foreign markets. So, um, the principle of taxation in the country of destination leads to relative simple effects when it comes to um, indirect taxes. However, when we just talk about neutrality requirements for indirect taxes, there is yet another neutrality requirement because um, neutrality must also be guaranteed with regard to the chain of entrepreneurs. You know, there is not always one supplier alone working on something, but usually there is a long sequence of distance. Different, sorry, the suppliers who share the work. So the first one creates a raw material, the second one a half finished product, the third one a finished product, and so on. And finally, the good reaches the final customer. And what one must definitively avoid is that the tax in the final product is or has a different um, extent or different volume, different amount, according to um, how many entrepreneurs were involved in the fabrication. You need a kind like once only taxation effect. And so you must prevent that the tax piles up in the course of time. All that is probably too abstract to understand it, so let's explain it in plain words with a simple example. What is our problem? Imagine uh, what happens if we have a tax that is levied on every stage of production with every transaction. And we have a different number of businesses involved in the production of a good or service. Then what happens? Let's have a look. We have Enterprise A. They produce raw material, let's say iron, and their own costs for that production is 100. So their minimum net price, which they need to cover the cost, is 100. 
if now the VAT is 20%, they need to add 20% in order to also cover the costs for the VAT. And so we have 120 as minimum gross price, which they need to charge to their customers. So enterprise A demands 120 euro. Now enterprise B produces from the iron and a half finished product, for example, steel. They buy the raw material for 120. They have own costs of, I'm so sorry, um, own costs of 100 and 100. They have a maximum net price now to cover the cost of 220. If they have to charge 20% VAT, then the price goes up by 44 to 264. Now, okay, 264, ladies and gentlemen. Now, um, the Enterprise C produces the finished good, that's a car, raw material 264, own cost again for reasons of simplification, just assumed to be 100. Their minimum net price is now 364 plus 20% VAT. Uh, then you arrive at 416.80. That is the price which you can offer now as Enterprise C to the final customer. 416.80. Now we have an alternative chain of entrepreneurs. It's a very simple one. Here in the alternative, there's Scooch McDuck. He is only one single entrepreneur who owns enterprises and factories on all steps of production. So Scrooge McDuck, DD, produces raw material iron, has costs of 100 and has no VAT because he doesn't sell but uses the iron himself again. Goes on producing steel from the iron. Again, additional own costs of 100 for the step of production as the competitors. Total costs are now 200. Now, um, no VAT because the good is not sold, but just transferred to the next factory hall of DD. Um, then the steel is changed into a car, the finished product. Additional own costs again, let's say only 100. So we have um, now costs of raw materials. So half finished product, 200 total costs. 300, that's the minimum net price, plus VAT, 60, minimum gross price, 360. So DD can offer it to the final customer for 360. Now, the other alternative, A, B, and C shared the work, led to 460, And then it's relatively clear for which price will the customer buy and where will the customer buy. Customer will buy from DD. So... In that case, the VAT system or the system of any other indirect tax led to an effect that one entrepreneur could kick off all the others from the market, sharing, dividing the labor, um, made no sense. So you erased the longer train of entrepreneurs from the market and that makes no sense because um, it's not the task of a VAT system to erase distribution of labor, division of labor from the economy. So what do we need? We need a system which leads to the same uh, total amount of VAT in the final product. In all cases, irrespective of if one, two, three, or 100 entrepreneurs shared the work during the production process. And the simplest approach, there would be VAT is only taken at one step, for example, only when the retailer sells to the final customer. Unfortunately, uh, with many, many goods, it's not possible to see immediately and clearly if your customer buys for business purposes or if your customer is indeed a consumer. So you would have to ask him or her and you would get no honest answer.
So it would be an unbearable risk for the seller if you give the seller the task to find out if the consumer buys for business purposes or not. So a retail tax only would not work. So the equivalent approach, and not but with another technique, was that the tax is taken on every level, but then paid back to the consumer by the fiscal office. If that consumer, or better, customer, if that customer is again an enterprise and buys for business purposes. Because in contrast to the seller, the fiscal office has the power and the possibilities to control for what the customer used the goods. If the customer just said, I am a business, the fiscal office can check if it's a lie. If the customer is a business but did not use the acquired goods for business purposes, the fiscal office has the best chance to find out and to punish the customer for the attempted or successful fraud. So this way it could work. So what we have in practice that we have a VAT system where every transaction is fully taxed, but then a refund is given to the customer if the customer is a business that is just owed to practical advantages for the seller. It's far more easy just to pay VAT always and then uh, to give for the fiscal office to give a refund to the customer um, because that's the only way how in practice the system can work. Here we have Enterprise A produces now raw material that's iron, own cost 100, VAT 20, price cost 120. Now, with that small modification with the refund claim, Enterprise B buys that good, um, has raw material cost of 120, own cost of 100, gets a refund of 20 for the VAT included in raw materials price. Total cost is now 200, no longer 220, because costs which are refunded are no costs anymore. So total cost is 200, so your minimum net price is only 200. VAT on top 40 euro um, leads to a gross price of 240, which you charge to every customer. You pay the 40 to the fiscal office. Now, if you deliver that good to another enterprise, enterprise C, the calculation for Enterprise C is again as follows. They produce a car, use your raw material from Enterprise B for 240, have additional own costs of 100 for labor and other things, get the refund of the VAT, which is included in the input. Now that leads to total cost of only 300. That leads to a minimum net price of 300. VAT on top of that is 60, so Enterprise C can sell for 360. That is, now the chain of entrepreneurs A, B, C can offer their final product for 360 to the final customer. That is now exactly the same price as it was possible for DD to offer. And so by this trick, we have now achieved neutrality in the chain of entrepreneurs. Okay, so consequences from the principle of neutrality uh, for the chain of entrepreneurs. First, if a good is taxed, but another good, which can easily be taken as a substitute, is not taxed, then the market conditions will be distorted. So um, goods should be taxed in the same way. We had that in the beginning. Um, with coffee tax, it can only be two euro for everybody or five euro for everybody, but you can't not mix the rates. Uh, 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 however, when you tax coffee differently from tea, uh, will there be substitution effects or not? So um, that's sometimes a problem if you think about 7% rates and 90% rates, so reduced and high rates. So you should tax all the goods equally which are in competition with each other and can be substituted against each other. Then a second important consequence is the tax need only to be or must only be taken once 
Um, but we need to make sure that imports and exports are treated with um, with the adequate care. So you need to make sure that production or import cannot happen unnoticed. Uh, so you need to supervise enterprises which are subject to an indirect tax thoroughly, and you need to control the imports. And within the EU, where border controls no longer exist, you will have to check what happens to import and export with alternative measures. Um, very often, where you can't really check it, you will at least have to limit the impact of different tax rates on competition. For example, by requiring that every member state levies a certain minimum tax rate on certain goods. And number three, um, if you have a system with combined VAT and refund to business customers, then you must in practice ensure that refunds do not take place without justification. So that people not by fraudulent measures and activities claim refunds for input tax, which we in reality was never paid or where they never got these services or goods. So where they just pretend to have paid input tax for the raw materials or the services which they acquired for production. This is not a trivial problem. The damage estimated from unjustified refunds within the EU is estimated to be approximately 50 billion in German uh, notification 50 milliards in the whole year in the whole EU per year. Um, so you will have to establish effective mechanisms to um, control and check the refund claims. That is, for example, an explanation why you have very, very strict formal um, requirements applied to a correct invoice which confirms a VAT payment. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is, by the way, in practice, the most relevant problem for enterprises who have to deal with VAT and do B2B business. Between them, in reality, and in principle, VAT should not have any cost character. But when problems in the invoicing happen, then it can be that the one who charges VAT in an invoice has to pay it to the fiscal office, and that the business customer does not get the refund due to formal mistakes of the person who wrote the invoice. So that is not much fun. And it's one of the reasons why people must be definitively um, yeah, familiar with the rules on the AT. Otherwise, you can create huge financial damages for your enterprise with a tax which otherwise would have no real cost significance. Well, that was the remarks on indirect taxes. So now let's talk about the neutrality requirements regarding the taxes on income. This will be our next thing. So what are the consequences for of neutrality for the design of taxes on income? Well, here you also have neutrality with regard to insert internal situations. Probably there must be a development in the history, at least of your tax, that all kinds of income must be taxed alike, at least all kinds of income which can be substituted by the citizens against each other. Otherwise, the system breaks down because if you only tax farmers but not noblemen, everybody wants to become a part of the nobility and all noblemen will buy the farmers' estates because then you no know, tax will be paid on the um, profits from the farms, then in the long run you either have to change the tax legislation or your system will be breaking down because no taxpayers will be left over. The same if you only tax business purposes but not tax advisors, doctors and others, then everybody who can will prefer to take a job such as such a free profession in order to avoid the tax. So the catalog of taxable income will in the course of time, if you want it or not, 
develop and become more and more comprehensive. You cannot leave things out. If you want to know why lottery winnings can still be left free of income tax, well, lottery winnings, that is not a strategy to say I renounce on a job, a secure and stable job and live from lottery winnings because this is too implausible, so too unlikely. Nobody can trade, take lottery winnings as a different way to finance his or her life and so as a regular income. So this is not a substitute for a regular job, so you can treat it differently. Inheritances, uh, the same. Uh, they are free of income tax because, well, you can't really say, um, I'm not learning for a job, don't study. My strategy to finance my living is just to wait for inheritances from people who like me. This is um, no viable alternative, and so it can be treated differently. Um, however, naturally, inheritances are taxed with another tax, so as a kind of property taxation. Well. Yeah, and um, very, very often you have, uh, you can notice that the development towards a very comprehensive um, definition of income takes a very, very long time. So usually a list begins with some professions somewhere in the Middle Ages, and then in the historical um, development, more and more other possibilities to generate an income were placed on the list. Sometimes that explains remaining differences in um, the existing tax laws because, well, sometimes the way how the catalog of income developed still shows remnants or remains of the former distinctions or of the beginnings of the tax system. For example, um, in former times there, was, there were two main theories about what income could be. One said an income can only be something which regularly flows. The idea was you can't live on uh, something which happens only once or twice in your life. So the idea was if somebody had an income, that should be something which regularly flows. And the idea was also the tax can for the financing of its expenses not rely on extraordinary events which just happen a few times in the lifetime of somebody. <clears throat> and so, um, a group of experts voted for or was adherent of the idea an income can only be what flows regularly. So extraordinary events, especially selling your property, selling your business property, were regarded as um, not income because it was not regularly. And the idea was you can't um, finance your life based on an occasion which happens only once or twice in your life. However, um, there were already economists at the time where, who said that, well, the price of a good is nothing else than the discounted value of all future current incomes, which can be expected from that good. So um, selling an asset for its discounted value of all future income is nothing else economically and collecting all the regular flows of income at once at this point of time. So economically, selling a good and collecting the regular income flowing from it is, well, two alternatives of the same thing. It's equivalent. And that means you cannot, in the long run, sustain treatment where one economic alternative is treated differently by tax law than another totally equivalent behavior. And that is why there was a tendency in modern tax legislation that also selling a good would turn into a taxable event. Hmm? Um, however, sometimes history still has left traces. For example, in the English tax system, they still say income is only what regularly flows. But under the pressure of um, the economic constraints, they also tax the gains from selling goods. But that was something which they then called capital gains. And for that, they designed an additional tax called capital gains tax. 
which is nothing else than the income tax on selling goods. So the gap closed uh, due to economic constraints and let's say the evolution of tax systems which drove tax legislation in England not to leave that gap open. Um, even when they later designed a corporation tax for juridical persons, then they from the beginning onwards gave up the distinction and just called those profit of the corporation. So you see, there are economic driving factors, but sometimes traces are left over until, let's say, a completely modern approach is done on the then based on the modern views, if you are lucky. In German income tax law, you also have traces of former old fashioned and outdated views. Here we still have a distinction between the seven types of income, the historical list of activities which were one by one added to the list of things which you had to tax. But um, here that distinction between the two theories, the regular income theory or the um, source theory and the theory that every increase of property is an income. They left traces because when the German legislator in 1890 approximately designed the first version of the German income tax, then they just said, okay, um, let's, let's make a compromise where the big money is with the independent self um, not employed people, businesses, the first three types of income, we are going to take the concept that every increase of property, so also selling the underlying property is income. Whereas for the average citizens activities, employed people, income from capital investment, uh, income from lease and rent and from other income, we stick with the old theory that income is only what regularly flows. Then also here we could see the development that evolution said you can't leave things which are economically also income. The gain from selling a good which can produce income is nothing else than discounted income of the future. So you can't leave that out from your concept. And so in Germany we still have the former ideology but in the area of the last four types of income uh, there were more and more additional rules, special rules closing the gaps. For example, for real estate, there was a rule if you sell real estate shortly after acquisition, nowadays within a time period of 10 years after acquisition, then it is nevertheless taxable. When you um, sell capital income, we arrive already at the logical final point of the development because since 2009, law has been changed, every sale of a capital investment is also leading to a taxable gain. And um, yeah, with other income or employment income, the problem does not really matter so much. So also here we have some historical structures which were then amended more and more by evolution. Um, and you should yeah, draw the conclusion from that. Although there might be different starting points and different underlying theories, there are strong underlying dr economic driving forces which force the legislators of different countries in the end to make their income definition or income list more and more comprehensive and close more and more gaps in the definition of what could be regarded in tax as income. Well, so let's sum this up that means that for internal situations you probably when you tax income will end up in the long run with a strange definition but a comprehensive definition of what income is so that everything where you get richer by and at least where you can rely on to finance your living um, will be on the list of taxable things um, the only exceptions which you can afford as tax legislator are exceptions where you can say the average citizen has no chance to use these alternative um, events to finance a living so that they cannot substitute the other activities and do not become competitors for them. 
Well, that was neutrality with regard to taxable activities in the from the inland perspective. Now, we must also have a look to the fact that nowadays we are an open society, so the border is not closed but open. We have international contacts, contacts, sorry, and so we naturally have to um, think about what has to happen in cross-border situations too. Um, well, if we look to economic constraints, then here we see two um, important basic principles or problems, or however you call them. Um, first, there will be a necessity for what we call in German an unlimited and a limited tax liability. Um, unlimited tax liability, by the way, limited tax liability does not um, allude to the the tax rates. So an unlimited tax liability doesn't mean or imply that the tax rate is very high or that the tax burden is unbearably high. It just says the tax claim is not limited to income generated in my own country, whereas in case of a limited tax liability, tax claims are limited to things coming from the inland. Um, you have an economic necessity if you are a clever legislator to have both to tax your own people based on a worldwide income and to tax foreigners on what they earn in the inland and now when every state has that then we will have a need to avoid double taxation um, in cases of cross-border activities because when you live in one country you will have to pay taxes on what you earned abroad in your home state and also the country where you earn the money will tell you well you earn the money here so you are subjected to our, by us to limited tax liability so you will be taxed twice with the same money and this is which problems we have to deal with in cross-border context when it comes to income taxation so let's begin at the beginning why do we have a necessity for most states to tax the worldwide income of their taxpayers. Yeah. Well, um, how can we understand that most states do this? Hmm. And by the way, additionally, we might ask, why do you not only tax your own citizens, but everybody living in the inland? Because in taxation, in income taxation, citizenship usually it doesn't play a role, it's only relevant where you live. So let us think about the why. Here's the world. You live in the inland, so here's your home. And um, that's the inland, that's the other country, the rest of the world. And now imagine your country has a tax of 60%, the neighbor state only levies 10%. And now an easy question is, if you are a believer in a ceteris paribus analysis uh, when it comes to tax consequences, so if you are a traditional economist, then you probably ask yourself this question, where will you like to invest, where will you like for a new job, etc., etc. And the answer is, in such a way to look at the world, the answer would be clear. There is a high risk if you look at the situation from this theoretical model that you live in the inland but you want to earn all your money abroad because there it's cheaper. So economists and people believing them see the high risk that everybody will now move economic activities abroad. So what you would do in such a world if you allow that only income from the inland is taxed and um, the income abroad is not taxed at home then you allow that earning money abroad is cheaper under the tax perspective and then you um, can prognosticize that every activity is shifted abroad so you ruin your own economy your own people do no longer want to invest in your country they all want to do everything beyond the border so, not a success. Um, so, in this way to see the world, you only have one 
possibility to avoid this catastrophe, you must make sure that under no circumstances at all, earning money abroad can become cheaper than earning the same money at home. And that means but that can only be achieved when your tax claim extends to everything which your people earn all over the world. So that is absolutely necessary. You must choose that approach because you have no influence on the other country's tax rates. So you can't prevent that now or in the future your neighbor country or the country beyond your neighbor country takes a 10% rate instead of your 60%. And um, well, it might be that a Citrus Paribus analysis is not a really a good approach, but there are people believing in them. And it might even be that your taxpayers are among these people so that they don't look to variations of the gross income, but are so naive that they only react to the tax difference and say, okay, beyond the border, it's 10%. So I invest there, then I have a better feeling. I lower my tax burden well, and the rest is for me to complicate it. So I don't look to that. So even if it were economically, or even if it is economically not convincing that um, there will be distortions, it might be that if people deeply enough believe in that Ceteris Paribus view of the world, that then this view has consequences for economic behavior. So the only way you can prevent that your citizens get off cheaper when investing in another country would be, okay, we extend our tax claim to everything which you ever earn, irrespective of where you earn it. So we have a worldwide income taxation. Um, that seems to be relatively compelling. I once saw a list, unfortunately, it was somewhere in the English Wikipedia. I, I do not remember the keyword um, correctly. It might be international taxation or something like that. There was a list of 207 states and territories on the earth which levy an income tax and 90% of them indeed approach um, followed an approach where they tax their citizens on a worldwide basis. So the idea seems to be really compelling. Now the remaining amount of countries, by the way, who did not follow that approach usually had not the problem that the citizens could shift money or investment abroad and because either they had no income tax at all or such a small amount of income tax that nobody wanted to avoid it, or they didn't have any rich people who could shift any property or activities to outside uh, to other countries. So that there for non-tax reasons, the problem didn't exist. Okay. Uh, by the way, what I also wanted to clarify whenever I talk about a German taxpayer, an English taxpayer or something like that, or a foreigner. Now in taxation, uh, that never means that the person has German citizenship. Um, this is generally to be understood that it's only a simplification for a taxpayer who lives in Germany, a taxpayer who lives in France, or a taxpayer who lives in the UK or so. So a foreigner for taxation is usually, in our technical terms, just a person living abroad. The nationality usually does not play a role in taxation. That's clear and evident. Why does no reasonable state uh, tax only its own citizens? Well, what would you do if you have a worldwide income, 500 million live in Germany, and you only need to pay taxes if you have a German passport? you would relinquish and give away or give up your German citizenship and live here then happily ever after. So that's impossible. That is a clear explanation for why every state, reasonable state, taxes people living in that state's inland without any respect to their nationality. Additionally, it might be that if somebody lives abroad and has your nationality, you also want to tax their worldwide income. That is, for example, done by the Americans. Um, however, that can only be done with people living abroad. They can give up their nationality if they want to, 
Uh, for non-tax reasons, sometimes they don't. But you can't rely on financing a state only by taxing people with your own citizenship. Uh, at least not in the modern world. In the Roman Empire, you could have done, because there, if you lived in the Roman Empire and had Roman citizenship, you had civil rights. And if you didn't have that citizenship, you had far less citizen, um, human rights, so you were willing to pay high taxes and or the taxes at all in order to be treated like a human being and not like a um, yeah, subjected person in an occupied territory. Well, um, let's forget about this small remarks to concern with citizenship and go back to our main problem. So we have already understood why many states will, or most states will feel the need to tax their own inhabitants of their country on a worldwide basis. Now we still need to understand why the country also will tax foreigners on the basis of their inland income. So from, let's say, non-Germans, non-German residents will nevertheless be taxed with their German-based income. Um, why is that the case? Hmm. Again, if you want to understand a rule, um, try to find out how the world would look like if the rule would not exist. So, when you look to the foreigners, they will probably pay tax in their home states, but the tax in their home states on their worldwide income are not necessarily as high as in your own country. So, what could happen is that you have a foreigner who pays less taxes than your own people do. So it could happen if you don't tax the foreigners yourself that a foreigner earns money in your country and pays less taxes than your own people on what they own in your country. So the economic situation would then be strange. Let's have a look to a certain example. Imagine you have an inland taxpayer and um, this inland taxpayer, let's say it's you, opens a new business in a garage in your town. Here's the garage. And um, the idea is relatively uh, new. It's a success. You earn 100,000 in the first year. Now, the German tax rates or you know, tax rates in your country have unfortunately gone up a bit. The tax rate is 90%. I increase that so much so that the effects of the differences become drastic. So you see more quickly what happens. So you pay 90% taxes, you need to live 9,000. You have for investments left over 1,000 euro. What do you invest? You buy a small mat, which you place in front of your door. Here it is. And on the mat, you have the words, welcome dear customers. On the other side of the same street, a foreigner a copies your idea, also rents a garage or buys a garage and does exactly the same what you do. In the beginning with the same success. So the foreigner earns 100,000. Now the foreigner lives in a country where in his home state the income tax is indeed 0%. So the foreigner earns 100,000 and has left over after tax 100,000, can reinvest 100,000. And what the foreigner now does is he places a second floor on the garage, doubles his um, stock so that he can offer more to customers and this is a situation when we go to the second year of our story. In the second year, you still have your small garage with the same amount of stock as in the first year. You earn again 100,000, you pay 90,000, you need to live 9,000, you have left over to invest 1,000. What you can do with the 1,000, you can pay the walls. Um, your competitor now has um, twice as much as you had, so earns 200,000. Has again a tax of 0%, so has 200,000 fully left over for reinvestment, and builds two additional floors on top of the existing building, doubles again the amount of goods offered to customers, becomes more attractive again here. This is the situation at the end of year two. So next step. Let's go to the next year. 
we can simplify life you again uh, 100,000 um, you earn 90 um, you you pay taxes you have left over for investment for some 500 or 1,000 euros uh, the foreigner has 400,000 can reinvest that in full amount and adds four new floors your decision is to buy some light bulbs for your firm why light bulbs because your part of the street has become so dark and shady during recent months so uh, when you now compare the development of that garage firm established by the foreigner in your country and by yourself you see a grave discrepancy in the chances for competition in competition the foreigner has far better possibilities to finance growth under exactly the same circumstances just because of tax and that ladies and gentlemen should be clearly understood that can't be no reasonable legislator in the world will ever be able to tolerate that so what we then necessarily must conclude no state will ever allow that a foreigner has this privileged situation for investment in his own country so a state will have due to compelling economic considerations to tax the foreigners with their income from his own country uh, here, its own country here because otherwise your own people have grave disadvantages and the only way how you can make sure that the foreign investor pays at least as much taxes as others is to levy a tax on their profits on your own you will by this have to tax the people living outside your country too at least with the income from your country now one might um, question why this tax claim must be limited to what foreigners earn within your country and there the answer is naturally simple again um, imagine there is a millionaire and the millionaire considers to invest in a project in your country where she can earn 100,000 but there is a worldwide income of hundreds of millions um, naturally you would as a foreign millionaire then say no I don't invest in Germany if an additional profit of 100,000 in Germany triggers a German tax on my full worldwide income so that is what no legislator can afford um, and that is or makes clear why you have this specific variant for foreign investors we must take their tax their income from the inland we can't tax the rest so for foreigners the tax claim will be limited to their inland income oh, seems to be clear um, by the way that also very nicely compares with basic rules of international law because in international public law states agree in general that a state can write every law it wants to but there are restrictions a state can not apply its laws to events which have no connection to him to it whatsoever so what you can do is you can regulate uh, by your own laws everything which your citizens or your people do all over the world and um, that is indeed done in the field of taxation although their citizenship doesn't play a role if somebody lives in germany so is one of our people economically um, international law tolerates or makes it possible that everything they do worldwide is subjected to our laws so we can also subject everything which they do worldwide to tax law um, if the person has no connecting connection with our territory we can nevertheless subject to our laws everything which happens in our country or has an impact to uh, things in our territory so inland events and indeed that is what happens if a foreigner earns money in Germany the maximum of what international law allows is we can subject that what is done in the inland to our laws not more and so the limitations of unlimited and limited tax liability indeed nicely reflect the maximum 
of what can be done under international law. So it fits economic logic and it fits the rules of international law um, agreed upon by all the states of the earth by convention. So that is a nice parallel. Uh, remember, please, don't get irritated by the phrase that there is an unlimited tax liability in Germany or a limited tax liability. It only means, in the one case, the tax claim is not limited to the inland income. Uh, um, it taxes your income coming from everywhere, whereas limited tax liability signalizes in that case, the tax claim is limited to what happened in the inland. Um, that's important to know this. And further, it's extremely important that the term unlimited tax liability or even unlimited taxation is um, felt by outsiders not familiar with the German tax terminology as absolutely shocking. Tell some average citizen in with a very conservative state averse mentality somewhere that Germany has an unlimited taxation. They probably try to take up a gun and uh, try resistance or bring down that state because an unlimited taxation that sounds unbearable uh, like a communist country and um, so it's better if you speak with foreigners or about a taxation that you then say we have for residents a taxation on the worldwide basis then the other guy will nod and say yeah i know we have the same or that you call it the taxation of resident people then he or she will also know okay i know worldwide basis uh, but you should avoid that term unlimited tax liability or even unlimited taxation when you speak with a newcomer to the field not familiar with German tax terminology um, already because it would be a bit misleading and provoke some unwanted emotions in the other guy. Okay, well, um, let's talk about logical conclusions of what we have heard. Every reasonable state will have a worldwide income taxation for its own people. Every foreign state will have an inland taxation for foreigners earning money. So if you have a cross-border situation, you will always have a double taxation. The state where the taxpayer lives will claim money, uh, taxes on that money, and the state where the money comes from also raises hands and says, hey, here, I want to. Limited tax liability. So you have a double taxation. There will be one tax in the country of origin and the other one will be in the country where you live. So that's a problem because getting taxed twice has drastic economic consequences and a state must think about that. So which problems can arise? Here you have situation A, the most drastic one. The total of all tax rates applicable is a bit higher than 100%. So let's imagine here's your home here is the world, here is your own country, 60% is what it claims. The other country has a tax rate of 50. Now you earn 100 and let's do the calculation now. Taxes abroad are 50%, taxes at home are 60%. The net uh, outcome is a loss of 10. Um, the reaction is clear. You can't help yourself by working harder because if you work harder, your income goes up to 200 and the loss goes up to 20. So you can only draw one conclusion in this situation. I will never do something cross-border. Um, a double taxation which ends up at 100% or more is nothing else than an effective closing down the more of the border. There will be no cross-border contacts for economic uh, motivation. No economic working together. And nowadays the tax rates are very often a bit lower than 60 and 50, so the risk that this situation really arises is a bit lower, but what happens if the tax rates don't add up to 100%? Surprisingly, we still have basically the same problem. Here is your home, 
here is the world here is your inland tax rate 30 percent here is a tax rate abroad 30 percent here is a calculation you earn 100 you pay 30 you pay 30 at home the net outcome is a profit of 40 which is your net profit and which you can freely spend and, and be happy about it however if you choose the inlet alternative, you can earn 100 again. You have a tax abroad. No, you don't have. You pay the tax once, you have 70 left over. And so when somebody offers you a cross-border investment or cross-border economic activity, you have one reasonable reaction probably. Thanks, I will rather prefer remaining at home with all my activities. So even if a double taxation exists and does not lead to a more than 100% tax burden, it still has a lock-in effect. Um, you will want to stay at home. The step across the border is too expensive compared with all reasonable similar alternatives at home. And you should see that um, in that situation, you, the cross-border person, um, pay more than people at home and also you pay more than competitors in the other country. So whatever you do, you are in disadvantage. Now you should even see that um, if the situation changes and you even earn less at home and you could abroad, um, earn more abroad, even then, as you see here, the net profit at home will be higher, so you stay locked in in your own country. Even if the foreign country here produces 100, that is 25% more of rentability than at home, you will prefer to invest at home. So what does that mean for technological progress, for example, when your own people have the choice between participating in a new technology with higher rentability abroad or sticking to the old traditions of the inland, they will decide for the old tradition of the inland. What does that mean for your managers and so um, who compete for investments? Well, they will be relaxed and say, oh, this uh, modern stuff abroad, uh, some new development, we don't care about it. It's unnecessary because our shareholders, our investors still trust us. They give us their capital. So we are good enough we don't need to um, follow every new trend abroad, so let's let's forget about that. What's going on there? Now, um, now imagine what happens if um, the rentability in the inland drops down to sixty. Abroad, you can still or you can earn one hundred. Uh, make a calculation: sixty minus thirty percent is forty-two then it's still better than investing cross-border for 100. So your investors still do not shift the investments cross-border. Although now there is 40, so two-thirds more of rentability than the 60 at home. You see the technological gap and the gap in how good you, you work with the capital which you get, it gets more and more wider and wider and now at the end let's say in the inland only 50 are produced abroad 100 and then you make the calculation 30 percent taxes minus 15 net outcome is 35 and now your capital market begins to wake up if we shift investments abroad we have more now your manager see oh what's happening our investors go and shift their investments abroad we don't get fresh capital we have a problem at the capital market we should react but then they uh, they say how can we react and the answer is well we should also invest in progress new technologies and somebody says which are the new technologies well look abroad and now the um, competitors abroad have already 20 30 or so years invested in that progress and now the problem is how can you follow up that lead? How can you get equally good? And there is only one simple answer, you can't. That train has departed a long time ago and you missed it.
and you will never catch it up. So in that case, double taxation gave your people a strange and wrong sense of being invulnerable and of being um, untouched by developments abroad. So they didn't do their job, they didn't react, and so you had a technological delay. And in the end, you are not good enough anymore and you will never be good enough again. It would have been different if when in a, former, in a foreign country, rentability rose to 105, your capital markets would have begun to react immediately. Investors would have been um, caused to shift their money abroad. Then your own people would have woken up, there's something going on that seems to be dangerous for um, our investments. We should try to be equally good. We should try to be even better. We should react, we should invest and in progress. Reorganization, whatever would have helped. Then the race would have been open. Now the race is lost. So double taxation can, by its lock in effect for investments, can lead to um, grave problems for the development of your industry in the long run or of your economy as a whole. So this, I am still preferring my home country for investment. In the short run, it might even be attractive to, to shield um, jobs and so for, for against foreign competitors. But the problem is in the long run, it's absolutely detrimental, damaging. It ruins your economy. So the conclusion which is necessary to here is Taxation should not hinder cross-border activities. It should be neutral in a certain way. It should make possible that investments flow cross-border. So what is the right way to design a tax system in a way that it copes with double taxation in a way that these negative effects don't show up? Well, there are different concepts of neutrality in that context, which can be discussed, and we are going to have a look at them. So, a first possibility to create some neutrality would be you make sure that your investor in the foreign market pays only the same amount of tax as your foreign competitor. So, in that case, you have the same chances as your competitor in the foreign country. Um, that would imply that you establish neutrality with regard to the circumstances in the country where the capital is imported to. This is why in uh, textbooks this form of neutrality is very often called capital import neutrality. To illustrate how it works, here a small sketch. That's the inland, that's you, the tax rate at home is where you live, 60%. This is the world, this is the foreign country, and uh, the tax rate here is 50%. So your profit calculation in case of capital import neutrality would be, you earn a million, you pay 500,000 as your foreign competitors, uh, and that's it. No additional taxes at home, so you can reinvest 500,000 and finance grows by it. Your local competitor has uh, 1 million, pays a tax of 500,000, has for reinvested 500,000. So you see here neutrality, equal chances for growth for both you in the foreign market and for your local competitor in the foreign market. Um, however, um, if you are an adherent of a Citrus Paribus view, then you see here the theoretical risk that investing abroad can be cheaper than at home. That might make you nervous. So there is neutrality in the foreign market, but no neutrality from the perspective of the inlet. If you look only to taxes and assume that all the rest is equal. What, as we said in the, one of the first lessons, is an unrealistic assumption. However, it exists in the minds of people and in textbooks. Well, um, as you see, 
logically sound is that Sartori's paribus analysis only if all other circumstances can, in the realistic circumstances, be identical. This is usually not the firm in the case. Um, a factory set up abroad analyze completely different laws than a factory set up in your own country. There are different natural, natural um, surroundings, there are different labor conditions, different labor mentality, motivation, and so all that stuff. However, um, there might be situations where the Ceteris Paribus condition could also become realistic. And the more it becomes realistic, the more dangerous capital import neutrality concept becomes for your home market. Um, one of the cases where it can be realistically assumed that um, the gross revenue is untouched by from where it comes is interest revenue from a capital investment, so from giving credit. This is if it is given in the same um, currency and if the um, debtor has the same ranking or rating, this is then probably both 10% before tax. If then tax creates a difference, that would immediately completely distort the market. Um, see, for example, if you have 1 million interest before tax and a credit in the inland would trigger inland tax of 60%, then you have 400,000 left over. If you invest abroad and you had only to pay 50%, then you have a net outcome of 500,000. It would be clear that every investor would only grant credits cross border. And so capital import neutrality there would probably make people uh, much, much nervous. So there can be cases where an alternative neutrality concept is more convincing, namely neutrality with respect to the market of the country where you live. So where Ceteris Paribus conditions are, or if Ceteris Paribus conditions are met or nearly met. Um, now that <laughs> that concept is named differently because then what you aim at is neutrality with the country from where the country come, the capital comes. So from where the capital is exported, and so. This particular concept where we are talking about now is called capital export neutrality. Capital export neutrality is um, illustrated here. This is your home. This is your tax rate. This is the world. This is the foreign country. They take 50. Your profit calculation is under capital export neutrality. Well, you earn 1 million. You are taxed with the tax burden of usual in your home country, 600,000. You have left over 100,000 for investment. You are equally treated with an inland alternative investment. So no um, distortion, absolute equal chances compared with the inland investment. However, if you compare with a foreign competitor in the foreign market where you invested, they pay less tax and have for this reason, more money left over for reinvestments. So here you have neutrality, here you don't have it, and the concept of capital expert neutrality. And both neutralities together can only be achieved if the rates are identical in both countries, because then you don't have such a problem. Um, so you see, when you look to do I have equal chances in the foreign market? That can only be achieved if you grant people capital X import neutrality. So that you say, yeah, pay taxes there and we don't pay taxes on your income there because they took already enough. On the other hand, when you look to capital export neutrality, you would try to achieve that the tax burden of your taxpayer for foreign income is exactly as high in the total as if they invested in the inland. And the question is, when is which concept most adequate? We could even say, okay, if you invest in the foreign country and your money and compete with foreigners, then capital import neutrality would be best if you have your money 
if you compare to equal chances to the home market to where you live then capital expert neutrality is the best but we could make life a bit more complicated by thinking about um, a mixture you have an enterprise abroad you invest money there you obtain a 500,000 net profit there under capital import neutrality and now you do something which we didn't discuss you now take that foreign money and shift it to the inland market and let it work they are reinvested there now the question is what is now adequate economically as long as you earned and kept the money in the foreign market one could advocate for capital import neutrality you should have equal chances abroad but now you brought it back and so it now interferes or has an impact on the inland market uh, the home market and so that would be from the original thought probably capital export neutrality in former times people thought about this a bit more and came to interesting solutions for example a group of countries in former decades and years and so um, saw this possibility and had a reaction a mixture of two concepts they had a taxation of foreign income on a remittance basis that meant uh, the foreign income was left free of tax at home as long as the foreign income stayed outside your own country both as long as it stayed abroad so that automatically ensured capital import neutrality you were not taxed at home but only in the foreign country as long as you kept the money invested there uh, so you had equal chances with your foreign competitors but when you later transferred the money home the idea was now that money begins to compete with alternative investments in the inlet market and so then we go over to capital export neutrality and increase the total tax burden on your money remitted to the inland to the inland level by declaring the money now taxable as part of the taxable worldwide income that was an interesting compromise between the two concepts the idea was okay as long as you keep your money in the foreign market you need equal chances there so we don't tax it but when you bring it home then it has an impact on the home market and so then we declare it taxable and only then and take care that the money has a total tax burden comparable to the 60 percent at home uh -huh. um, nowadays by the way this uh, taxation on a remittance basis um, is a concept which has nearly died out it uh, faded away by tax reforms more and more um, the question is for example um, what is then what's correct under an economic aspect um, can it really be that an income generated abroad and then transferred to the inland afterwards have a negative impact because it was earned under a 50 percent rate and is now reinvested in a, to a market where the rate is 60 percent if so an open capital market would be highly dangerous for neutrality of competition however we have in the beginning of our lectures already discussed what happens really if you renounce on that satirist paribus assumption then you see there is no real distortion because when in the first year you have 60 percent in the inland and 50 percent abroad then well the gross returns before tax will be the market must take care of that will be different so that the net returns in both countries are equal otherwise the market mechanisms would not work so a stable capital market for investments in factories in the inland and abroad require that in the inland you would earn 1.25 million pay 60 percent taxes 750,000 have a net return of 500,000 for an investor of 10 million abroad where the tax rates are cheaper 
uh, or lower, there you only need to earn 1 million and probably you only do it. So um, you pay 50% and so your net return is also 500,000. That allows the market, capital market, to function if the borders are open. Otherwise you get distortions. And now you see there is, when you now transfer the 500,000 from your 10 million investment, the 500,000 net return, when you transform them to the inlet, there is no com distortion of competition there because a comparable inland investment of 10 million will also have produced a net outcome of 500,000. Otherwise, things would be strangely going wrong in the market. So this um, explains perhaps why such a taxation on a remittance basis is uh, not a necessary measure. And so evidently, if something is not really necessary for the functioning of the market, you can understand why it could fade away from more and more legislations and why it could die out in the course of time. Well, for these reasons, mainly two approaches are left over to deal with double taxation in the international arena. The first possibility is to declare foreign income as tax-free at home so that it's only taxed abroad under the same circumstances as abroad. This is the so-called exemption method because the foreign income is now exempted. So here you renounce indirectly on that taxation on a worldwide basis where you think you can risk it. So that leads to the um, establishment of capital import neutrality and equal chances for your investor in the foreign market. However, um, it can also happen that a country does not believe in capital import neutrality, thinks capital export neutrality is far more important. In that case, that country will take care that your total tax burden is equivalent to what you pay at home. However, due to the negative impact of a double taxation, they will also try to avoid it and they will try to take greatest care that your total tax burden is equivalent to what you pay at home, but not higher. And so usually when they charge you with 60 and you already paid abroad 50, then they only levy the difference. So they say, our interest is that you pay 60, but not more. You already paid abroad 50, so give us only the remaining 10, which are the difference. Then your total tax burden is 60, as in our home country. And that was our aim. It should not become cheaper. Um, so which concept you establish, either the exemption method or that credit method, where every foreign tax payment is credited to your inland tax liability, um, which method you establish there, that just depends on the personal preferences of the legislators and on the question how much a Ceteris Paribus view of the world might seem justified. This leads to capital expert neutrality then. Okay. Well, you can, in addition to all these cross-border aspects, um, so also um, have a look to the neutrality of the income taxation under other aspects. Um, one of the frequently discussed aspects is if taxation is neutral with regard to the legal form of an enterprise. And the answer is in most countries of the world, no, it is not. So that choosing the legal form is a very interesting question and will always be influenced by taxation. Um, another aspect if, is if taxation can be legal uh, with regard to the way how you finance your enterprise activity, so with equity or with loans. Also there we have these important differences in the total tax burden and these will be discussed in depth later. However, just to give you a first overview, let me make some initial remarks that you can understand why, for example, neutrality with regard to the legal form is not easy. Um, let's, for example, begin with natural persons, 
they pay income tax, whereas the radio persons usually pay corporation tax in most countries. Now, the rate of income tax is usually progressive. That means the percentage of the tax goes up with a higher income. So, not only the tax increases with high income, that would also be the case with a constant tax rate of 10%. 10% of 1,000 is more than 10, is less than 10% of a million. No? But a progressive tax means that with 10, with 1,000 you pay 10% or so, and with a million you pay 50% of the million. So the percentage of the tax rate goes up with increasing um, taxable income. At the moment in Germany in the year of 2020. To 2022, we have 45 percent top rate. This rate especially will apply to income from business. However, under the pressure of capital market competition in the world um, for income from a mere capital investment, the rate is um, capped at 25 percent. So there was a special flat rate for income from dividends and interest. Um, so even the neutrality of income taxation for all different kinds of income has been broken up in reality. Juridic persons, however, only pay a fixed rate. Now that makes sense because progression for rich or poor corporations can't be um, kept up if because everybody who invests and plans uh, to make, let's say, some 100 million with a corporation, if that led to a higher corporation tax than having only 50 million, then you would not establish one GmbH, but just two GmbHs, and everybody makes, every one of them makes a 50 million profit, and so you have lower wages. That means in the area of corporation tax, a progression of the rate is probably impossible. And that explains why it's always a fixed rate. Um, furthermore, we are probably surprised now that the German rate is 15% instead of 45% for rich private persons or rich natural persons. And here the answer is well, that must be seen to with an eye to the fact that the corporation always pays a trade tax on top to the city, which is in contrast to the situation with natural persons not refundable. And also when the corporation pays out their profits to their shareholders, the shareholders have again to pay income tax on the dividends. So that here we have in the course of time always two taxes on income. First, the tax on the corporation level. And second, the income tax of the shareholder level. And that naturally in total is as much or even a bit higher than what a natural person would pay, even if they pay 45%. So there are differences in treatment of different legal forms. And um, they, are not, um, they are not treated completely equally. So equal success before taxation depending on the legal form, turns in different outputs after taxation. So if you have to decide if you run uh, your business as a sole trader or in form of a juridical person, you will then uh, also always look on the tax impact, the tax rules. For example, in the situation I described just now, as long as a corporation doesn't pay out its profit as a dividend, it is lower taxed. When it pays them out, probably the total tax burden on those levels is a bit more than in case of a natural person. And so choosing the right legal form depends strongly on the expectations, how much can you win in the future, and um, on the plans, how much are you going to retain and reinvest, and how much are you going to distribute and consume of your profits. So, when it comes to um, how an investment is financed, we also have the differences there, which make um, analysis of the tax rules interesting. 
For example, if an investment brings 100,000 and is financed by equity, then this capital causes no business expenses. So the 100,000 will be fully taxed up to 45% um, if you're a natural person or with full corporation tax and trade tax. Um, and then with the corporation, the total tax burden then we still um, depends on what you do with the money, keep it or distribute it to shareholders. When, however, you finance an investment with a credit, um, then you do not only have a revenue from the investment, but also interest as an expense for the capital. And now to simplify matters, let's assume that the interest is exactly as high as the revenue, 100,000. So you yourself have a profit of zero, no taxes on the business level. For trade tax in Germany, that's modified a bit, but in principle, this would be the tendency of how the tax situation would be for you. And in the hands of the recipient, the income uh, from interest is uh, most often regarded as income from capital, so it would be taxed only with a 25% rate. Um, so you can easily see this is not neutrality for financing operations in a German tax law. So taxation will also have strong impact on that. Uh, you can probably expect that when you enter a bank building, there will be at least in the headquarter of the bank, some very, very highly special um, experts for the field of the impact of tax law on different financing operations. It will always play a role. Let's now turn to the last form of taxes. The taxes you remember were on income, on property, and on consume. We have already discussed consume and income taxation. Now let's have some small remarks on the taxation of wealth property. That can be done, as I told you already in one of the previous lessons, either annually by a constant low tax on everything you have on the 31st of December, or at one point of your life, at the best point at your death, by inheritance taxes with high rates. Let's first discuss the annual wealth taxes. If you take an annual wealth tax of 1% of your property, then that would have following consequences. You have invested capital. You have a profit before tax of, let's say, 10%. You pay income taxes 45%. You have a net income which remains and then you have on the invested capital to pay an annual wealth tax, 10,000. So it lowers your net profit again to 45. So yeah. if we vary the profit before tax, 5%, um, then the impact is again, 1% is still lowering the net profit because you need to pay this tax from something and if it's an expense so your net profit goes down considerably interesting is naturally when the rate or when the rentability of the yield on the invested capital goes down um, the wealth tax gets more and more interesting um, for example what would happen if you have only 3%, then you have only a minimal amount of um, positive rentability left. And if it's a bit less, so when you have an economic crisis or even losses, then uh, the wealth tax might uh, increase your losses or even turn a small profit into a loss. Um, what would be the effect if the wealth tax is set higher? Let's say at 3% of the invested capital. Then we would have an effect that a 10% gross profit before tax is turned in combination by income and wealth tax into a small remaining net profit at only 25,000, so 0.25%. 
not very highly attractive. Um, if you have a profit before tax of 5%, then you pay income tax and then you pay the wealth tax and surprise you already end up with a loss. That's the reason why in real life you very often do not find a wealth tax which has a high prof, a high rate. If it exists somewhere, it has very small rates. Here you can see the why. And um, high rates can only be afforded when you tax property only rarely. That could happen with an inheritance tax. Um, the inheritance tax, let's say, um, would be tax taken in case of death of the owner of an enterprise with a certain percentage, which is then higher, let's say 20%, 30%, 50%. It's all possible. Uh, however, when you have an enterprise and you tax their equity with a rate of 30% or 50%, this is a huge and enormous challenge for the liquidity and finance planning of the enterprise. You know that due to a sudden accident, it might be necessary that within a short time, let's say one month, three months, one year, you need to obtain cash um, to pay out or to pay for half or a third of the equity. That can be enormous amounts. And the thing is, it's usually unforeseen and unforeseeable. So for natural persons, a huge risk and if you take precautions for that by negotiating with the bank, um, if we need it, you always are present. You are always prepared to give us a credit of, let's say, 50 million on short notice. Uh, that will cost you money. So it's expensive. Um, when you see now to the competition effects, there might be juridic persons. They don't die. Um, so there will be no inheritance tax on them. However, they have shareholders who can die. If a shareholder dies, the shareholder needs to pay inheritance tax on the value of the shares. The shareholder will then probably demand for dividends if the shareholder has an influence on the, com on the company. Um, well, but you see on the first glance already, an inheritance tax has a problem first for the liquidity planning, economic problem. Second, it has a problem concerning the legal forms, the sheer first glance shows you there is not exact neutrality. And um, you have also different situations depending on if you have one owner or a multitude of small little owners. Because when you are a single merchant, have an equity of 100 million and die, then suddenly all the inheritance tax on the 100 million gets payable. That's a huge shock. If you are a company which has 100 million equity and where shareholders exist, let's say 10,000 shareholders, well, then they usually don't die at the same time. So one dies, he needs a small amount of money to cover the inheritance tax that could be done by the firm or by credit by a bank it's a small amount well that shareholder could even sell the share without that the firm breaks down so even with a partnership for example a natural person part several ones hold firm 10 partners uh, and from time to time somebody dies but they all don't die at the same time and the inheritance tax gets due on 10% of the equity, let's say this. And two years later, the next partner dies again. Inheritance tax has to be financed on 10% on the equity. Um, absolutely different from the situation where one and only shareholder or owner dies. And inheritance tax has to be financed on the spot on 50 on all of the equity. Let's say 30% of the equity are gone from one minute to the next one. Um, that's a problem. So when you sum up the problems of an inheritance tax for economy, for businesses, then you see unforeseeable. Um, whereas this con coincidence effect gets 
smaller, the more owners unite to run an enterprise. So an inheritance tax on business property has an inherent built-in effect to be favorable to enterprises where many, many small owners cooperate and where, so AGs, GmbHs, which are held by a very huge amount of shareholders, but not small partnerships or sole traderships. The second is you have a liquidity effect. Um, on short notice, unforeseeable, you have to uh, obtain money quickly to pay taxes. And naturally also your equity goes down that might impact your rating. Um, very often, legislators react to these problems um, in the way that um, they try to make exemptions. For example, we have many states where an inheritance tax on business property has been abolished at all because inheritance tax endangers businesses, or they reduce the tax rate for business property, or they even said we abolish the inheritance tax completely. Um, the problem is then you end up with different new neutrality problems and problems of injustice. If you tax somebody with 100 million private property and take away 50% from that, it's difficult to justify that somebody else who also disposes of 100 million, but business property shall pay nothing. We end up again with the Scooch McDuck problem. If somebody, if Donald Duck inherits from Scooch McDuck and um, sits on trillions of dollars, that would probably all be business property. Um, it can't be justified that Donald Duck, who never will have any economic success, never have any income tax to pay, then sits on a huge amount of money and pays no money, no cash, no tax at all, with the argument, well, it's business property, it's needed for the business. Uh, very difficult to justify. So my personal opinion is that the problems of inheritance tax should be solved by looking more closely to the problems which it really creates. The problem is not that there is a taxation on the equity. The problem is the liquidity effect and the unforeseeability. So you could perhaps tax away 30% of the equity of a firm, but not at once. That's the first thing. And not in such a huge amount. You should make inheritance tax planable. And that, for example, would be a compromise, kind of a compromise between an annual wealth tax and um, a kind of an inheritance tax, just to say, okay, we have seen, for example, that an annual drain on the equity of 1% can be financed. What about the solution to say, um, if somebody dies, then we set an inheritance tax, let's say 30% or 50% or 20% on the property, but then we only collect it in fixed installments of irrespective who the dying person is, 1%. So one enterprise pays that off within 20 years due to 20% tax rate. If legislator says a higher rate is adequate, then you pay it off for 30 years, but always in 1%. That would be a drain on the equity, which would be manageable. The second thing is you could also take precautions more easily. You only need to speak with your bank about, well, our owner is 85 um, we will in all probability have to take care that we can on short notice finance 1% of the equity. And then in our plans for the future, we need to take into account that in all probability in two, three or four years, perhaps even tomorrow, we will always have an additional burden of 1% per year, no more. That's planable. The same. The, um, such a system would reduce the impact um, of or the, the importance of how many owners you have. Because if you are a partnership with 20 partners, uh, the problem, well, they all don't, don't die at the same time, but you can say, okay, 
from the one or other date it can happen quickly that we have to finance an additional one percent on the equity of partner a probably two years later on the equity of partner b and if partner b and a die in a car accident at the same time it's still again one percent on the equity which we have always to take precautions for that it could hit us annually starting either this year or next year or in 10 years but um, it would be more manageable and that is why i personally am a great fan of a concept like this setting an inheritance tax once that's a, let's say 20 or 30 percent and then pay it off in equal installments um, then at the end every in enterprise which was inherited bears constantly for a while the same manageable small financial burden and um, so such a kind of a mixture of an annual wealth tax of one percent and an inheritance tax in the form of yes we said only an inheritance tax we once have the bureaucratic procedure we take a huge amount of money but then you pay it off slowly and constantly until you are off the hook um, that would be manageable you also then need many exemptions because let's say you inherit as a private person a family home and somebody says oh you have now to sell your home uh, because you need to pay money you need to pay the inheritance tax 30 or 50 percent no you would not need to because if you can pay off that in constant um, installments of one percent per year you will be able to finance that uh, common sense says who is not able who inherits a house of uh, with a value of one million and is not able to pay one uh, percent of that amount per year doesn't really deserve that house and will also not be able to keep it because uh, that person will have to give into the maintenance cost or other costs immediately if something unforeseen happened so that would be affordable to everybody so that is a short overview about um, why inheritance tax is also a promising and interesting object for analysis of um, business decisions or so but um, now I told you a bit about my own views on how inheritance tax should develop um, however as present law does not follow such an approach but tries to solve the problem with complicated tax exemptions under even more complicated conditions which you then have to follow for at least 10 or more years no inheritance tax in practice nowadays still poses a major challenge for tax planning and enterprises um, and that is also a thing which should be known to you okay and Okay, that's enough for this time, for this chapter. I thank you very much for watching this video. Um, hope to see you soon on the channel. Don't forget to um, like the video if you want to. Please do it also if you don't want to. And don't forget to recommend the channel to others whom you like, if you like it, or to recommend it to others whom you don't like, if you don't like it. Okay, thank you and goodbye. Till next time.